Over the next few episodes, we'll be talking about pitch modulation. But before we do that, we need to know a little bit about pitch, specifically how it's measured and how it's expressed. This is about to get very theoretical, so I'll put timestamps in the description so you could skip right to the synthy parts if you want. <laughs> Up until now, I've used frequency and pitch interchangeably, but there are some distinctions that can be crucial in certain contexts. Frequency is a measure of cycles per second, and it's expressed in hertz. Pitch, on the other hand, is our perception of frequency, and it's expressed in different ways depending on the context. Usually, we'll see pitch expressed in terms of 12-tone equal temperament, in which we have 12 notes in each octave, each separated by a semitone, which is equivalent to about 100 cents. Where the notes actually land in terms of frequency depends on our reference tone. Most often, we'll use 440 hertz. The reason we distinguish between pitch and frequency is something called octave equivalence. If I play a note in two different octaves, it'll be perceived as the same note. Because of this phenomena, we often base our tuning systems around octaves. In our 12-tone system, for example, we have 12 distinct notes, and each has a representative in every octave. But we run into some issues once we try to define our notes as frequencies. Octaves aren't linear, they're logarithmic. An increase of one octave is equivalent to a doubling of the frequency. A decrease of one octave is cutting the frequency in half. Because of this, our frequency differentials between notes vary across octaves. In other words, adding and subtracting hertz will not do the trick. Historically, we've overcome this through tuning systems based around ratios, and this makes a lot of sense. We begin with our reference pitch and multiply or divide by a ratio between one and two. To replicate your notes in different octaves, just multiply by two to the n, where n is the number of octaves that you'd like to move. Ratio tunings also have the added benefit of arising naturally from the sound itself. The overtones that accompany sound are integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. So, in a way, ratio tunings are derived from the notes themselves. But this derivation is also ratio tuning's greatest weakness, because we're always operating in reference to a note. So, for example, a tuning system based on C and a tuning system based on an A will have different frequencies for the same notes. And let's take this a little further. If we play an F-sharp major scale in a C-derived tuning, our overtones will line up with C, but not with F-sharp, meaning despite all of our tuning, we'll still be out of tune. So while ratio tunings seem like the most natural and logical route, they introduce inconsistencies between keys. Luckily, we live in the future, and with our future math, we can easily solve this problem that kept generations of instrument makers awake at night. If x is a reference frequency, 2x is an octave above that frequency, and x over 2 is an octave below. 2 times 2 times x is 2 octaves above. x over 2 times 2 is 2 octaves below. Because of octave equivalence, these are all experienced as the same note. So if we generalize this, x times 2 to the n represents every appearance of this note, with n being the number of octaves above or below our reference. To get the other notes, just divide n by the number of notes you want in your scale. So for a 12-tone scale, we just do x times 2 to the n over 12, where x is our reference frequency and n is the number of semitones above our reference. And just like that, we arrive at a tuning system that applies equally well in all keys. But there's a catch. While 12-tone equal temperament works equally well in every key, it doesn't match the overtones of any single key, as well as the ratio tuning built around that note would. And yet again, despite our tuning, we're left out of tune. Luckily, we're close enough that the subtle divergences aren't super noticeable. With 12-tone equal temperament, we've essentially compromised our fidelity to the overtone series in exchange for flexibility. Whether this is progress or a tragedy is up to you. So to summarize this entire rant, frequency is linear but our experience of it is logarithmic. Within equal temperament, we use sense to collapse this logarithmic relationship into an easy to use linear representation. So why am I talking about tuning in a synth video? Well, it can be kind of important. Let's take detune for instance. Most often we'll see detune represented in sense and semitones. As we move across the keyboard, the semitone differential remains the same, meaning our frequency differential increases as we move up the keyboard. Notice when we have slight detune that we experience a fluctuation of the total amplitude. This is referred to as beating. 
This is a result of the waves going in and out of phase with each other, creating patterns of reinforcement and cancellation. The number of beats per second matches the frequency differential between the two oscillators. So for instance, if we're detuned by 2 Hz, we'll hear 2 beats per second. With traditional detune, the resulting beats are inconsistent across the keyboard, with faster beating towards the high end and slower beating towards the bass. Occasionally, synthesizers allow us to manipulate beat frequency directly. This is a sort of linear detune, where we can offset oscillators by a set number of hertz. While this keeps the beating consistent, it doesn't keep our pitch differential in sense consistent, so as we move to the lower registers, our detune becomes more extreme. In a few episodes, we'll see something similar with pulse width modulation. Pulse width modulation creates a sound that's equivalent to a ramp wave and a saw wave detuned by a set number of hertz. This means that a patch using pulse width modulation could create gentle chorusing in the upper registers while creating detuned chaos in the lower registers. For modulation, we normally deal with sense and semitones. This allows us to create musically consistent movement within our sounds. So if we create vibrato, we don't have to worry about it becoming unruly as we move down the keyboard. The primary exception to this is audio rate frequency modulation. If our modulator is below audio rate, we'll use exponential modulation to create musically consistent sounds. But once our LFO approaches 20 hertz or so, we'll start to notice unpredictable changes in pitch and timbre. With linear FM, we'll still have the timbral changes, but they'll be stable and controllable. In fact, there's an entire method of synthesis, FM synthesis, based around this. In FM, audio rate sine waves modulate one another to create complex timbres that would be impossible in traditional subtractive. In the next few episodes, we'll deal more with the practical applications of these concepts. But try not to lose sight of what's happening. Are we dealing with frequency or pitch? Is our beat frequency consistent or our detune? Will this patch be unusable on one end of the keyboard? And while you're thinking about these things, look for the opportunities. Modulate beat frequency to create rhythms out of phase cancellation. Use key tracked LFOs for pulse width modulation, creating the illusion of doubling your oscillator count. Use audio rate linear FM to modulate a sub audio rate carrier, creating beating that's consistent even into the overtones. The possibilities really are endless. If you like this episode and want bonus tutorials, support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash that beat. This week we're deriving a couple of ratio tunings and testing them out in different keys. It should be a fun time. As always, I'm that beat and this has been Synth Fundamentals. Thanks for watching.